I am delighted to introduce Tracy Colley from the Race for 2030, who is going to introduce this session and chair it for us. They are sponsors of the conference program this year, and uh, we're absolutely delighted with a significant report that was recently released by them. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm assuming that most people hopefully have heard about the report that was released at the start of May. There's been a few people quoting from it, so though that is great. But I thought I'd just give a brief introduction to what race is and what we do for those of you who aren't super familiar with us. Um, so we, RACE is an acronym, it stands for Reliable, Affordable, Clean Energy. We are a cooperative research centre, so that means uh, we put together projects with our research partners, with funding from our industry partners, which is matched by federal government funding. And the driver for RACE is really all about saving energy costs, reducing greenhouse emissions, and focusing on the customer end. So it's about bottom up, not necessarily top down. Uh, we started in 2020 and we're a 10 year CRC. Um, so that makes us quite long in duration. We've got about seven years to go. And really we're about driving innovation in the clean energy space uh, from an Australian perspective. And our vision is really a low, flourishing low carbon Australia, uh, where energy research provided by our research partners um, improves the quality of life and boosts energy productivity for all Australians. So there are four research programs and in those programs there's separate themes. I'm part of the Race for Business program there's also Race for Homes, Race for Networks, and Race for Everyone. And one of the themes in Race for uh, Business is biogas. Uh, and that's... Um, some of the other themes that we have also have uh, crossover into biogas. So, for example, decarbonising value chains, Industry 4.0, decarbonising heat and business power flex can also be impacted by an impact on um, biogas projects as well. Uh, and really what RACE is about is creating leverage in the market, supporting early market leaders to identify and assess innovation, and particularly because of our research partners, it provides credibility in the research outcomes. So at the moment we have over 70 partners, uh, which includes a number of organisations who are here today. And the, there's different tiers of partnership, which range from tier one partners who contribute um, money every year, and who are committed for the life of the project through to uh, project only partners who only commit to a, an individual project and collaborative partners who only uh, contribute in kind to an individual project. And our research partners are listed on this slide. So we have CSIRO, Griffith University, Queensland University of Technology in Queensland, UTS and UNSW in New South Wales, Monash and RMIT in Victoria, University of South Australia, and Curtin University in WA. Uh, this is a slide that has all of our partners, including our research partners, which is a, a lot to take in, I'll uh, admit, but they're also listed on our website. So, by way of introduction, our current session is about the essential role of renewable gas in the energy transition. And although to date uh, there have been a number of behind the meter type projects, for biomethane or renewable natural gas, whatever you choose to call it, to really play its part in decarbonising Australia, we need to move forward with uh, injection into the grid and use in end users. So our speakers today represent uh, owners of gas infrastructure, uh, 
organisations who are trying to decarbonise their operations, and then some consulting and industry overview of what some of the potentials are. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome to the stage Jared Irving from the Australian Gas Infrastructure Group. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thanks for having us. Uh, it's been a fantastic conference so far. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to those past, present and emerging. My name's Jared Irving and I'm here from Australian Gas Infrastructure Group. Uh, I work across uh, renewable gas, uh, which is hydrogen and biomethane. And today's presentation is looking to explore the role that we see biomethane as part of achieving our goals for net zero, as part of our role in decarbonising our infrastructure assets. The production of and utilisation of renewable gases such as biomethane will play an important role in the transition to a low carbon gas network and biomethane offers a significant contribution to Australia's energy mix, which I think we've been hearing a lot today. We'll examine the key drivers behind the growing interests and the work that AGIG is doing behind the scenes to map the opportunities around our networks and understand really what is the biogas to biomethane potential that we see uh, and understand how do we transition to a low carbon network with the opportunities that we see in the vicinity of our networks. The locations of these infrastructure assets are going to be really important in the future uh, as we look to decarbonise. Our business, it, we're across Australia. Uh, we have transmission and distribution assets across WA, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia. We service over 2 million customers. And as we know, a lot of those customers are looking to decarbonise. We are looking at ways of how we can support them. And we're looking all across our infrastructure base in terms of decarbonisation and what that looks like. So setting the scene, uh, we've committed more than $23 million to renewable gas projects around Australia. There is a lot more, which we're hoping to announce shortly in the near future. We're doing a lot of work across hydrogen to begin early development in the hydrogen industry. And unfortunately, we do have a lot of biogas to biomethane, but given the confidential nature, we can't put too many on the slide. So we are looking forward, and uh, a lot of people in the, in the area know the work that AGIG is doing in the biogas to biomethane. Um, we have Edinburgh Park biomethane project, which we're looking to support. We're also doing a lot of work with biogas producers on how do we get that gas in the network? How do we support biogas producers to being able to upgrade that gas, get it into the network, and promote the growth of biomethane? I just want to give a bit of an overview. I know we've talked about biogas to biomethane, but what exactly is it and what, what is the process? And I know there's a varying level of knowledge base within this group. So I thought it'd be good to touch on and what we're seeing is anaerobic digestion currently, uh, or the future opportunity with anaerobic digestion, currently used in cogeneration and heating in Australia, as well as waste gas burners, unfortunately. And we're seeing significant volumes in the, in the businesses that we're communicating with in how much waste gas they're actually burning. Uh, so just with the people that we've been in discussions with, we're talking in petajoules, in just flared volumes of gas, which is scary to think about. So we have biogas. We've got to upgrade that gas, as has been mentioned earlier. And that goes through a process uh, in multiple different ways. We have a preconditioning or condensate removal. It's a saturated gas. We then go through a desulfurization process. We then remove the VOCs, siloxanes. As part of that process, we compress the biogas. And then it goes into an upgraded technology. And uh, this can be membrane, PSA, cryogenic, uh, and different scrubbing technologies. There's also the really big opportunity of CO2 distribution. So the extraction of CO2, which is going to play an important role as part of Australia's decarbonisation efforts. And I think we need to probably emphasise the significance of carbon dioxide and the ability to extract it out of a biogenic CO2 source. It then leads us to, if my clicker works, that biomethane then goes into our network, complying with AS4564, which is our gas specification standard, and going into the gas network. Now, with the renewable gas certification scheme, uh, such as green power 
or renewable gas guarantee of origin that can then be supplied to gas customers. Now, fortunately enough, this has been touched on quite significantly, but I do like to reflect when everyone does talk about biomethane, they talk about the limitations in terms of uh, volumes of, of biomass available. When you look at early in Europe in terms of biogas to biomethane, the opportunity was quite limited and they actually didn't believe that they'd get the volumes that they're currently getting or forecasting. So they're looking at feedstocks, and I know we're in terawatt hours per year, but currently they're producing 130 petajoules per annum, targeting 1,300 petajoules by 2030, and then moving to 2050, over 6,000 petajoules, which is just significant. It, and it really opens your eyes up in terms of the agricultural maintenance that you can do to enable that biomass increase. And I mean, from Race, to, Race for 2030 in their report stated the 370 petajoules, I think it looks much more significant if we can manage agriculture and we promote the potential policy and regulatory frameworks that enable the tilling processes, the, the rotational cropping methodologies that you can use to promote that growth. Now, what, what's, what's the role of biomethane? So the AEMO step change, uh, which is the graph that you see here, is a shortfall in domestic gas supply that we're seeing over the next 20 years. You see consumption, you see availability from the LNG, gas diversion into the south market. This usage is exclusive of LNG, uh, and it's also uh, exclusive of the west coast, because separate markets. So we, see, we start seeing shortfalls in 2028 in gas, which is quite significant, because we're not building conventional gas wells at the moment at any rate. So we're going to have a shortfall. And by 2042, we're going to have a significant shortfall, roughly around 100 to 150 petajoules per annum. So what are we doing to understand? Well, we want to map the opportunity. What does it mean for our networks? How much is actually out there? So we've spent the last six months really investigating, well, how much is out there? What does it look like? How hard is it to upgrade? And the results are quite phenomenal in terms of just our ability to discuss with who we know in the industry. We've been able to put together a map that gives us a bit of an idea of how we can actually leverage those capable biomethane facilities to get into our network. And the opportunity is significant. We're seeing the potential of 11 petajoules of viable biogas to biomethane resources just in the vicinity of our networks. Viable costing analysis to see if that meets current costing for biogas to biomethane. So I'm not talking about a fully enabled regulatory environment or policy enablement. I'm just saying this is just close enough to where we're seeing gas prices. And I mean, fortunately, six to 12 months ago, if you were paying $30 a gigajoule, you were pretty, you're getting a good deal. But times have changed with the gas cap. And what we're seeing is a bit of a lower potential for 11 petajoules. But if with regulatory and policy influences, we could see that significantly shift upwards. So what does that look like in terms of AMO? And what can we replace? So our AGIG estimates, leveraging international growth rates in biometh biogas to biomethane projects, we're seeing a potential of 170 petajoules of gas available to the market. Now that significantly replaces the shortfall currently seen in natural gas or conventional gas. With an RGT target of 10%, growing 37 petajoules by 2030, which is a significant volume of gas that as we as we slowly get to the legislative policy frameworks, we see slowly fading away. But in that scenario, we see a growth potential up to 250 petajoules, which is still well below the 370 petajoules Australia-wide, but it's a target we can definitely hit. And business as usual, which we have to acknowledge is a sad state of affairs, but it may happen. If we don't go anywhere, we don't see many of our projects proceeding past 11 to 20 petajoules without the support of regulatory policy, which I think there's an echo in here from yesterday, the policy and policy. Now, what does that mean from an emission reduction potential? So we look at biomethane. Biomethane has an emission intensity of 0.13 kilograms of CO2 per gigajoule in accordance with Enger's part two fuel combustion. It's 53 for natural gas. So it's a 99.75% reduction in scope one emissions. That's fantastic. And I, PepsiCo would be super excited about that reduction in their scope one emissions. 
That's the importance, but what does it mean for the network under our scenarios? We see a reduction of almost eight and a half million tonnes of emission in the AGIG estimates and 13 million tonnes per annum uh, for an RGT value. Now, where to next? Um, so I guess there's a lot of work that we need to do and we're going to hear about policy from a lot of people today, but we need a standardised approach to biomethane connections into gas networks. Gas networks all need to agree what requirements we need to get that gas in the network. Certification, which thankfully we're going to hear from Green Power today about the great work that they've been doing, get certifying biomethane and hydrogen. Updating Australian standards, 4564 is really, really important. We need to, we need to move and progress that, copy what's been learned internationally. Recognition of scope one emission reductions. I mean, we want to recognise that we've put in a biomethane product that is, that is lower carbon intensive, and we want to be able to utilise that and share that with customers that are willing to uptake. People need to pay for the decarbonisation of, and there are people willing to pay a premium for that. Safeguard mechanism, leverage an asset, leverage a, leverage a piece of legislation that is promoting the, the reduction in scope one emissions. With $75 ACU price, it's a $3.68 in, increase in per gigajoule on a natural gas price. RGT, industry partnerships, and the additional the environmental benefits that we get from a biogas to biomethane. That's it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here on the lands of the uh, Yagara and Turrbal people to uh, be here at this uh, Bioenergy Australia conference. Um, Absolutely love the invite. Appreciate that, Shahan. Um, yes, uh, so my name's Jordan McCollum. I'm with the Australia Pipelines and Gas Association. And I'm just going to talk briefly on the, uh, the value of uh, gas infrastructure in amongst uh, supply and demand of, uh, of gaseous energy and uh, how we see that enabling uh, cost competitive uh, gas use decarbonisation uh, domestically. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar with the Australia Pipelines and Gas Association, we represent the owners and operators of gas transmission infrastructure today. Uh, so all of the red lines on the, uh, the right-hand side there, um, which uh, represents around 39,000 kilometres of, of uh, gas transmission pipelines delivering 28% of domestic end-use energy demand, plus several times that in, in uh, export. Uh, and gas exports as well. Um, we also represent a lot of the companies that feed into that industry to help make it thrive, a lot of the engineering firms, the parts suppliers, um, everyone that helps make uh, that, that, uh, that massive infrastructure work on a day-to-day -day basis and who are looking into enabling uh, pipelines for biomethane, hydrogen, other renewable gases into the future. Now, we've, we've known for some time that uh, the gas pipeline infrastructure is very high reliable and very cost effective infrastructure when you compare it to its, its, next, uh, its next nearest approximate, which is electricity transmission infrastructure. Uh, for example, our, our reliability, uh, our, um, on a reliability point, uh, we have about an order of magnitude less loss of supply uh, incidents in the gas transmission network compared to the uh, electricity transmission network. Um, and typically speaking, where you have a uh, similar uh, gas and electricity infrastructure in the one space, uh, electric uh, gas infrastructure is able to deliver more energy at a lower, substantially lower cost and cost to customers than the, than the equivalent electricity infrastructure. So knowing this about our industry, uh, we started asking ourselves several years ago, you know, whether or not our low cost, high reliability form of energy uh, transport can support the decarbonisation of Australia's energy system and most importantly the decarbonisation for gas users going forward. And to answer that question we engaged a, a, a engineering firm, GPA Engineering, to undertake a techno-economic analysis uh, comparing pipelines and power lines in like-for-like -like energy transport scenarios. So in that study, we considered uh, the, the cost, uh, direct like-for-like -like comparisons between uh, hydrogen pipelines, natural gas pipelines, HVAC power lines, and HVDC power lines across quite a broad case map of 256 cases, looking at distances from 250, uh, 25 kilometres to 500 kilometres, throughput capacities of 10 TJs a day to 500 TJs a day. And we also looked into the, uh, the economics of storing gas in those pipelines as well, for durations of 4, 12 and 24 hours worth of storage. And 
Uh, not super surprisingly to us, but possibly surprisingly to, to some who aren't familiar with the, with the infrastructure industry. What we found was that both pipeline options were substantially uh, lower, uh, more cost effective than the power line alternatives for, for the same volumes of energy across the same distances. Now, at the time, the biggest question that was going around was around hydrogen pipelines, but I really wanted to make sure that we included natural gas pipeline costs in, in this analysis because that is the equivalent to biomethane pipeline costs uh, as the biomethane industry starts to get off the ground. So the biomethane industry can be quite confident knowing that it has the least cost energy transport solution of all uh, forms of renewable en uh, energy that are able to be produced in Australia today. Um, further though, we, we did look at the uh, energy storage option uh, uh, costings as well. And uh, similarly, uh, looking uh, from the bottom uh, up the way, all the way up to the top, we see that energy storage in uh, natural gas pipelines and hydrogen pipelines is substantially cheaper than energy storage in pumped hydro or in battery energy storage systems. And once again, as another positive sign for the biomethane industry, uh, the, the blue line which represents the natural gas or biomethane pipeline storage costs is absolutely for cheap in the order of uh, dollars per megawatt hour storage uh, equivalents. So, you know, while this type of information about how, how cost-effective pipelines are at transporting and storing energy is really exciting to people like myself, uh, I recognise it's not that super exciting to uh, anyone who's outside of the infrastructure industry until we actually put it into a, a larger puzzle. And, and that was really what we were hoping to achieve by doing this study, was to fill a gap in a, a larger puzzle that we could see not necessarily being fully analysed when we talked about gas use decarbonisation for customers. And so having, uh, for, for some time now, we've had a bit of information around the different pieces of the, the puzzle for decarbonising gas use through the gas pathway or the electricity pathway. We've had understandings of wholesale electricity costs and wholesale renewable gas costs. We've had understanding from the, uh, from the AER around uh, retail energy bill breakdowns. Um, we've, there's quite you know, broad understanding around appliance efficiencies. And more recently, we've uh, been introduced to uh, the economics of transitioning uh, appliances cost-wise, where you start from a natural gas appliance in the home today and move that to either a, a uh, renewable gas compliant appliance tomorrow or electric appliances tomorrow. But the one piece in that picture that was missing was the, uh, the piece of the picture about infrastructure costs, and that's what that previous study that I was referencing uh, is able to add to that picture. Now, now that we have that information, we're able to put all of these pieces together to de derive what I refer to as the total customer cost of the energy output when you decarbonise gas use through either the electricity or the gas pathway. Um, taking this data, it's easiest to describe how, how this is done by splitting it into two steps. Steps one is to uh, model a potential future retail gas or retail electricity uh, bill cost or, or uh, cost per unit energy for a net zero gas or a net zero electricity outcome. Taking the AER data, the, uh, the wholesale cost of production ranges and the uh, <clears throat> wholesale infrastructure information, we're able to uh, model out reasonably simply the differences in, uh, the difference ranges in retail net zero energy bu uh, bill cost um, for both electricity and gas. What we see is that we do get quite a, an increase in uh, retail gas costs by factoring in the wholesale cost of these renewable gases. But the really interesting thing there is that, uh, as, sorry, additionally to that, there is, um, there is some uh, network costs that we add in there, the, the purple hash. All of that doesn't nece uh, necessarily need to be the case if we do end up with a fully uh, renewable methane outcome for, for decarbonising uh, gas supply. Now, if we feed that, uh, that retail cost uh, into the appliance efficiencies and appliance costs, this is what we end up getting. These two bars represent the uh, total customer costs for net zero heat in the home in Victorian freestanding homes that have gas in the home today. And what we see here is that these two bars of cost for the heat coming out of these appliances sit approximately equal at the midpoint, which tells us that these two pathways, be it renewable electricity or renewable gas, can deliver a cost competitive outcome for gas use decarbonisation in the home. Now, we focused a fair bit on gas use decarbonisation in the home here, and, and, and there's a really key reason for that. 
Because if net zero gas is cost competitive with net zero electricity when decarbonizing gas use in the home, then renewable gases like biomethane provide customers with greater choice, greater opportunity, and greater capacity to choose from a wider range of options uh, when they're decarbonizing their gas use. And that's really what I was here to say. I feel like I've ran through that really quickly. Shahana said if I take less than 10 minutes, it's, it's okay. Um, I didn't want to get into too much of the detail. We'll surely chat about that on the panel. But uh, we, you know, that's, that's really the crux of where we see gas infrastructure delivering a low-cost energy transport and storage solution, and that feeding into an entire end-to-end -end supply chain that's able to deliver cost-competitive or cost-superior gas use decarbonisation outcomes for customers. So I appreciate your time, and I'll uh, pass on to our next guest. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Michael Steed, and I'm the Sustainability Manager for PepsiCo Australia and New Zealand. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the essential role of renewable gas and how that can help PepsiCo meet its sustainability decarbonisation objectives. Now, we've heard a lot about technology, lots of graphs. My presentation's just a little bit different. I'm going to share with you the story of our operations and how biomethane can help us decarbonise our Scope 1 emissions. Now, I too, when I acknowledge the the, excuse me, I too want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land today in which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Torres Strait Islander or Aboriginal people here today. Now, traditionally, when people think of PepsiCo, they think of our beverage portfolio, but we also make some great snacks too. And that's going to form the focus of my conversation today, uh, zeroing in on our, on our snacks business. Now, I'm sure I'm not out of line in saying that most people in the room can resonate with some of those brands you see on the screen. And that's the importance of why we're all here today, to develop strategies to be able to decarbonise a hard to abate uh, sectors such as the gas industry. In a few slides time, I'll share with you one of our processes and how biomethane can assist us meet our goals. From an Australian footprint perspective, we have two snacks manufacturing facilities in Australia. One's located here in Brisbane, the other in Adelaide, South Australia. And we also have an oats processing facility in Western Australia that provides oats into our Asian export markets. Now, our agronomy team work directly with potato growers from South Australia to far north Queensland, sourcing the crops that we do need for our, our potato chip manufacturing. And likewise, on the West Coast, our agronomy team work with, directly with oats growers. Each of our three facilities all rely on natural gas for process heat in the current state. And biomethane represents an opportunity for us to decarbonise those scope one emissions. The challenge for each of these facilities is that we're constrained by the land that we actually operate on. And we do not have sufficient space for a behind the metre solution. Thus, we need a gas mains delivery solution to provide biomethane gas through the natural gas grid. Now, I'm going to show you a very quick video in a second that sort of highlights our sustainability program, PepsiCo Positive. Now, this program applies science-based targets to decarbonise our operations, not only here in Australia, but in the 200 plus countries we operate in across the world. One example of one of those targets is a 75% reduction in our scope one and two emissions based on our 2015 baseline. We've already delivered approximately a 40% reduction against that target through the procurement of renewable electricity. So now our focus has shifted to gas, and I'll just play the video for you very quick. PepsiCo Positive is our bold global ambition on sustainability. We are laser focused on transforming the way we create shared value by leveraging our operations, our brands, our collective impact to make them forces for good for the planet and its people. Through positive agriculture, we'll source crops and ingredients in a way that accelerates regenerative agriculture and strengthens farming communities. In our positive value chain, we'll work to make our foods and beverages in a way that aspires to be water positive have net zero emissions and promotes a circular economy. And with positive choices, we'll inspire people through our brands to make choices that create more smiles for them and the planet, offer meaningful jobs and opportunities for our people and make a positive impact on the communities we serve. This is PepsiCo Positive. 
very quick overview of PepsiCo Positive. So just to reiterate, there are three strategic pillars that PepsiCo Positive represents. Positive agriculture, which represents growing crops that reduce our carbon footprint and impact on the watershed. Positive value chain, uh, decarbonising both our direct and indirect operations. And positive choices, extending our product offering for both you and the planet, where we're going to get a positive impact. The great thing about biomethane gas is it has the ability to impact all three of those strategic pillars, and now I'm going to show you how. This slide here represents one of our potato chip manufacturing processes. The process consumes 10 raw tonnes of potatoes per hour, fries in large continuous fries holding 8,000 litres of oil, and turns out three tonnes of finished product per hour, which is the equivalent of filling a B-double truck every hour of the lines in production. Now, Understandably, significant amounts of heat and energy are required for such a process. In fact, a 16 megawatt heat exchanger is required to power this particular line. Now, electrification of that is not currently technically available. But hypothetically speaking, if it were, the site would need to increase its electricity consumption by four times. Now, this would come with significant capital costs, unknown grid capacity constraints, and lengthy business disruption if we were to go down this path. However, biomethane offers a one-for-one -one natural gas comparison, as we've heard from some of the speakers today. And whilst commercial terms and conditions are currently unknown, I'm hopeful that biomethane will represent a cost-effective decarbonisation option for PepsiCo. Now, other than cost, why is biomethane so attractive to us? We're going to talk about a circular economy in just a second. But before we dive into that, our foods business, by processing raw materials such as potato, corn and rice already produces organic matter from those processes. Currently, we recycle that organic matter into compost and animal feedstock as necessary. But we feel that more value could be extracted from that particular organic matter, and biomethane is one of those particular options. The anaerobic digestion process uh, a byproduct, Digestate, also represents an opportunity for us to use within our agricultural business. The development of biofertilisers from Digestate is of great interest to PepsiCo. Now, I'm not an agronomist by any stretch, but our agronomy team have assured me if the nutritional value of a Digestate-type fertiliser was comparable to our traditional fertilisers we use in the current state, they'd be very interested in investigating this further. Now, if we draw our attention to the table on the screen here, this circular economy, we have our operations which produce organic matter. We already have the necessary infrastructure to separate that organic matter and distribute it into various value chains. If we direct into a gas producer that could also produce fertiliser, we'd need that gas injected into the gas mains grid. As that's been discussed many times throughout today's sessions and yesterday, gas certification is key for PepsiCo to go down this path. If biofertiliser was comparable for what we need in commercial potato and oats growing, would be looking to apply that to grow new crops. And those crops would be delivered to our manufacturing facilities where they could be consumed and biomethane gas used to turn out new products and starting the process again. So a true circular economy. In closing, whilst PepsiCo Australia New Zealand has the aspirations to introduce biomethane into its value chain, we don't have the land available for a behind the meter solution. Thus, we need producers, gas pipeline owners, retailers and governments, off-takers, all to work together to develop a strategy that develops a mutually beneficial outcome for all in the value chain. And finally, I wanted to thank all the sponsors for this week's events, in particular Race for 2030 that sponsored this session. And I extend that thanks to Shahana and the team at Bioenergy that have invited me to speak here today. Thanks very much for your time. Good afternoon. Australia Gas Networks accounts for 61.5 million tonnes of CO2 emissions annually. What does that actually mean to you? What does this amount of CO2 look like to you? Well, to give you some perspective, if you try to store CO2 
at atmospheric pressure and temperature into these large shipping containers, you would need more than 600 million of these containers. To give you a bit more perspective, the world's busiest container port in Shanghai only handles 24 million containers in an entire year. So if we were to keep all our CO2 that the gas networks in Australia emits, pack them into shipping containers and try to ship them out, we're going to need more container capacity, and that is equivalent to 25 times of the capacity in Shanghai today. Australia has committed to net zero by 2050. Fortunately, we're not shipping out these CO2 emissions. It will require us to decarbonize the domestic gas use. Six hundred million containers of CO2. Where do they come from? They come from the domestic gas that are directed that are transported within our gas networks today. So I'm referring to the delivery and consumption of this over 1,000 petajoules of gas each year. The good news is there are opportunities to address the 600 million containers worth of CO2. Energy Networks Australia has developed a gas vision 2050 and continues to update uh, this long-term decarbonisation plan today. And in the study that we've done for ENA, we focused on nearer-term opportunities for emissions reduction, looking at the 2030 timeframe. I'm Kevin, and I'm from Bloonami. The thing I love about Bloonami is the opportunity to help create and shape the future into one that we would like to be part of. We were known as Enia Consulting. You might find the name familiar. We were part of the team behind the Australian National Bioenergy Roadmap. And we've recently rebranded ourselves with a new name. And this new identity is associated with bigger ambitions and a desire for greater change. With 120 Blunamis, as we call ourselves, across six offices, we work on strategy, transactions, data, um, with players across the value chain, including governments um, and NGOs, to help diversify businesses and the economy away from carbon-intensive activities. We've got in-house experts that have built their careers across the value chain, including in chemicals, agri-foods, and they've now dedicated themselves to the energy transition. And we bring this to bear in the work that we do. Now, I assume that you are here because you believe that we can build our way to a low-carbon future, one that is not far off, but in the short to medium term. In the research that we've done for ENA, I have pulled out three key messages to take away for today. First, significant decarbonization of gas networks is possible by 2030. Direct and operational emissions from the gas networks are actually pretty small. And if you read between the lines, that means that lion's share comes actually downstream in its consumption and use. The networks already have the technology and are committed to reducing their part. And the third message is that biomethane is a key lever to unlock this significant decarbonization that we talk about in the near term. If you look at the emissions across the industry, the scope one and two emissions by the gas network forms only 4%. The remaining 96% comes through from the domestic gas use. Within this scope one and two emissions, we look at them in our research from the perspective of fugitive and operational emissions. They're within the scope of control for gas networks. The scope three emissions that is, the emissions associated with end use of gas is within the scope of influence of the gas network. The networks are able to influence, but not able to 
control the emissions directly. We'll look at them in steps. The scope one and two emissions, uh, 4%, um, are mainly results of unintended leakages, um, energy used within the operations of the network, and with the right actions coupled with the relevant policies, these emissions can be reduced by up to 50% by 2030, reducing fugitive emissions mainly involves improving leak detection, reducing operational emissions involves energy efficiency around energy used by networks. But the elephant in the room is the emissions associated with consumption. And it happens to be a 59 million ton elephant. With strong policy settings, this 59 million tons of CO2 emissions can be cut by up to 50%, but that's really aggressive. We can look at to aspire to 16 to 30% uh, reductions, but this would still take a lot of effort collectively across the gas customers. As you can see here, the main levers would involve greater energy efficient appliance uptake by the end users. So we're looking at, we're talking about replacing this to higher efficiency gas uh, appliances. We are also looking at um, using state of the art equipment besides household by industries as well. But the bigger chunk is going to, the bigger chunk of reduction is going to come from renewable gas as we've heard over and over again today. We looked at hydrogen. It can be blended into existing networks, but it's not going to make such a big punch if we're looking at a 2030 timeline. Of course, there's been very promising announcements by the Com Commonwealth uh, government that may secure part of this supply that we've uh, looked at here. But the most significant reductions can be achieved through biomethane. And I don't have to repeat again about the fact that it's a proven technology, it replaces natural gas perfectly, and that it contributes to the circular economy. In our study, we reflected the voice of the industry for strong and supportive policies directed towards enabling the supply and increasing uptake of renewable gases. We've seen today from AGIG and from the actions taken um, by Gemina that the industry has been moving, willing to take action to bring biomethane into their networks. The Malaba project has injected the first molecules of biomethane over just the last couple of weeks. Uh, but what we're all waiting for in this room is actually further leadership from policy. And one of the key policy recommendations put forth by the industry as part of our study is really the renewable gas targets supplemented by a robust renewable gas certification system. The green power pilot is important, and the Commonwealth government has stated that they're going to develop a guarantee of origin scheme for green hydrogen. Let's not forget methane in that mechanism. To summarize, we will have to combine a bunch of levers. Nothing is the panacea. And reducing fugitive and operational emissions will need more action at gas network level. Increasing end use efficiency of gas appliances can be undertaken at end user level. But at the level of the ecosystem, we will need to enable more renewable gas and increase the share of renewable gas in the networks. In the report, there are more details on policy recommendations. I won't repeat them here today. So do take a look. They're published on the Energy Networks Australia website. Um, we live, well, yep, made my point. <laughs> we live in very interesting times. I think Australia is committed and renewing the commitment to being a renewable energy superpower. But we need to make sure that this near-term roadmap actually bridges to the long-term strategy that we have. And the stakeholder study that we did provides a good glimpse to that. We have six and a half more years in this race for 2030. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm going to run you through some of the um, research projects which we have been investing in in the recent past and are doing at present. Although biogas technology is mature, there are still research questions that relate to both feedstock and how the biogas project itself is implemented um, that need to be answered in the Australian context. So um, most of you hopefully will be familiar with this document. It's the opportunity assessment that was done for the biogas theme. Um, it's a major piece of work, it took over a year. Uh, and it includes not just a technology review, uh, which includes feedstocks, environmental benefits, um, digestates, biosolid management, uh, a market status. It also looks at system transitions. So what are the other factors that need to change uh, within the Australian economy for biogas and biomethane to be uh, incorporated into the economy on a larger scale. Then also looks at the barriers. And most importantly, it developed a research roadmap uh, which will be touched on, there's a speaker in the next session who will also touch on some of the detail of this report. Um, but really it was about setting the stage for where we're up to at the moment with Biogas Australia and identifying where additional work is still required. Um, there's a QR code here, but at the end of this session and the end of the next speaker's session, um, there'll be a one page that has all the QR codes for the reports that are published. And most importantly, it identified, sorry, it's a bit difficult to see off the left there, um, that there were four key areas where research was still required. Obviously, feedstock supply is fundamental to any project. If you don't have a feedstock, you don't have a project. Um, scaling up and increasing the efficiency of existing systems looking at uh, improving the economics for new infrastructure and developing markets for new AD projects. And on the list th uh, left there, the, the column really lists the individual um, projects, research areas where we have identified that additional work is required. Some of this has already been acted on. Um, it's an area of a lot of intense development at the moment, so there's a lot of work going on. Um, but we are interested in talking to anyone who's interested in being involved. We will hold a consultation in uh, June in cooperation with Bioenergy Australia to try and put together um, some projects. Uh, because we are a cooperative research centre, uh, all our projects have to be supported by industry. So. Uh, there's a couple of other projects which are on the horizon. One has already been published. Uh, it was about biogas from agricultural waste. And it was, the project partners were A2EP, Helmont Energy, Queensland Farmers Federation and Singh Farming. Uh, and it looked at sugar waste co-digestion uh, with chicken manure. And particularly, it identified the issue of a larger centralised plant having better economics than a smaller distributed plant, uh, which is a move forward for Australia. Uh, in term, there are centralised plants overseas. We don't really have the same level of market penetration for centralised plants here. Uh, and it's, once again, identified additional research required from that. There's an upcoming report which uh, there will be a event in early June and it was about diverting organic waste, either food waste or garden organics from either landfill or composting and diverting that into anaerobic digesters. It was the, the project partners were AGL a range of different councils that were geographically located around the Sydney water plants that have the anaerobic digested. So Bayside, Blacktown, Penrith, Randwick, the New South Wales government, 
and also obviously Sydney Water. And the idea was to look at, rather than, um, it identified that food waste was the best candidate. Uh, and, uh, and it was really about maximising the potential of biogas production from that resource, rather than it simply going to landfill or to composting. Um, we will be having a webinar in June, and it will be advertised on our LinkedIn page, as well as our website. Uh, and then there's another report which will be published sometime later in June, which uh, relates to the wastewater treatment sector specifically. And it was uh, project partners were the City of Gold Coast, Hunter Water, SA Water, which covers the whole of South Australia, the Water Corporation of WA, which covers most of WA, and the Water Services Association of Australia. And it looked at uh, th thermal hydrolysis or wet air oxidation of sewage sludge to increase biogas production. Um, and there'll be additional research that comes out of that as well. In addition to biogas specific projects, we also have a number of projects where biogas is incorporated into decarbonisation for a, for a site. And uh, at the moment we have a project that is being led by RMIT and Monash. Uh, the industry partners are C4Net, Coliban Water and Sydney Water. The industry reference group is Ausgrid, the Victorian Government, Origin, Southeast Water and United Energy. And it's really about looking at how you optimise the energy flexibility for a water corporation, because they have a combination of on-site solar PV, um, biogas production, which can potentially be used for electricity generation or other uses, depending on um, what, the, what the operational requirements are, uh, as well as on-site, potentially on-site PV, uh, on-site EV charging, they have uh, potential for adaptive and fixed load, uh, fixed time load shifting. And so the idea is also to look at the surrounding residential areas that have solar PV and look at them as a virtual power plant that can provide electricity to the plan as well. So the idea is how do you look at that as a resource and how you optimise um, the energy flexibility for the water corporation in terms of whatever the objective is, whether that is reducing cost, reducing greenhouse emissions, or a combination of the two. And in theory, this, this type of project, it's being used here on a water corporation, but the same theory or the same application can be used at other sites that have a combination of solar PV, biogas production, and demand flex in their electricity consumption. Uh, the other really interesting project which is being run out of UNSW is called 24-7 True Zero, and it's about tracking renewables generation and consumption. Uh, obviously, this is becoming an issue uh, with the amount of curtailment we have with solar during the day. Um, companies might know that in a general sense they have a total, they purchase uh, renewable energy, but they're increasingly wanting to know that um, their consumption matches up hour for hour with uh, what's being generated. So increasingly, um, and one of the companies that's on the industry reference group for this is Google, so they want to know that if they're purchasing renewable electricity, that they can track that their consumption back to when it's being generated. And um, so, yeah, so this is an interesting project. It's um, about halfway through, and we are still looking for uh, additional pilot studies for that one. Uh, another interesting one where we're also looking for additional pilot studies is called Business Power Flex. It's being run out of Griffith University um, with support from UTS and Uni of New South, of South Australia. Um, 
And it's particularly interesting because um, sort of links to the energy flexibility for water corporations. One of the pilots is Sydney Water, who are looking at, uh, obviously they have biogas generation, but they're also looking at how they can flex their electricity consumption in terms of their pumping, rescheduling that, and also linking in their on-site EV charging. Uh, yeah, so that's basically a brief summary of the projects which we have, which are specifically relating to biogas, but also which integrate biogas into a total energy solution for a site. Uh, we are, we are, our main aim is really to support innovation, to reduce greenhouse emissions cost effectively uh, for Australia. So we are always interested in talking to industry partners who have a research need, linking them up to our research partners uh, and progressing projects which can help decarbonise Australia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Jared Leake. I'm the CEO of the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity, or A2EP. I'd like to start by making acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of these lands, and of course the elders, and pay my respects to them, elders like uh, Uncle Bill Bonney, who does a lot to maintain the uh, local customs and local knowledge. So today I'm here to share with you 20 years of experience of working with industry and how they use energy and heat and then four years of studies of how they intend to decarbonise and use renewable heat, and then 12 months worth of study where we've added on a more focused look at bioenergy and hydrogen. So for those who don't know, A2EP, we're a non-for-profit association looking at energy productivity, and that's all about getting more value from less gigajoules. We have a wonderful, broad range of members here and we see it as our role to help the adoption of energy productivity technology. Technology that is here and now. Uh, often commented that we have 80% of the solutions here and now. The building blocks are there. It's just a matter of how we put them together and how we size them and how we design them. So all about technology. The other thing that we focus on compared to a lot of other energy associations is energy demand. Our focus is really very much on how people use energy and what they do with that to create the products. However, we're getting much more closer and, and aligned with energy supply, as in the, with this uh, renewable world, uh, there needs to be much more interaction. It's not just energy on tap anymore. So energy supply is coming much more into what we do as well. So we've done a fair bit in, within uh, renewable energy. Just let me over the last four years, specifically we're working with the Australian Hydrogen Council over the last 12 months to do a, a big outreach program, uh, reviewing the technology that's available for using hydrogen and bioenergy, uh, as well as uh, the intentions of all the major energy users or heat energy users, uh, uh, what they plan to do going forward. Uh, we've done a lot of feasibility studies, a fair bit focused on food and beverage and using of heat pumps and what have you, solar thermal, geothermal, a whole range of options there for re renewable heating. Uh, we've done a lot of modelling. A recent uh, 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 publication came out from the federal government about the potential for heat pumps in Australia, uh, looking across uh, residential, commercial and industrial. I will say that our main focus, though, is on commercial and industrial. So what are we talking about here? Uh, 900 or so petajoules of energy that's used for process heating uh, across Australia. So if you look at this, this lovely graph, a lovely piece of work uh, done by ITP, paid for by ARENA, 44% uh, of energy in Australia used by industry. Of that, 52% or so is used for process heat. And process heat is just a way of upgrading materials and adding value. If you look to the right there, the really important piece that came out of this was breaking up this heat demand into different temperatures. And because not all petajoules are made the same, are used the same and have the same value, 
those Peter jewels at the higher temperatures above, say, 200 degrees, they're of much more value. You see, they're much more harder to, to obtain. Around about below 100 degrees, uh, when you can use things like heat pumps, those and solar thermal, those Peter jewels are fairly low cost and fairly easy to change. A couple of comments about this study. It did assume a generic 80% uh, efficiency when you're using heat. There's, there's a few flaws in that assumption, but it, it, it's good enough to get us in the right area. And it also uses these temperatures as supply temperatures. So the temperature coming from a boiler, not the temperature that it's actually used at. So 160 degrees from a boiler may be getting used to, for pasteurizing at 74 degrees. That 74 degrees is so much more important than the 160 degrees from the boiler. So what have we heard? After many, many feasibility studies and a lot of outreach, uh, two fairly clear signals coming from us. Electrification is, is the first uh, uh, pathway being explored, followed by biomass and biogas. Hydrogen really not forming too many uh, uh, trajectories at the moment and pathways just because of that uncertainty of supply and cost. And a very quick summary of, per sector of, of what, uh, uh, where people are headed. Alumina is, is really number one by far in terms of process heating in Australia. So where they go, what they decide to do is really going to be the big swing factor here. And right now they're focused heavily on electrification for their lower temperature uh, opportunities and for their higher temperature around 1,000 degrees for calcination. It's a combination of electrification and hydrogen. It's really hard to say, I must say, which way that will go at the moment. Uh, food and beverage, a, a balance of electrification and bio, cement, they can, they're looking at a fair few different options there. I'll also draw your attention to the little icon there talking about material efficiency. Uh, that can also be uh, applied across a lot more and that material efficiency, reducing the amount of materials you use, can reduce that energy requirement as well. If we look at uh, pulp and paper, already using a lot of bioenergy, and, and so they'll continue to use that and get more of that. But also electrification is a really good option for them as well uh, when it comes to looking at uh, concentrating some of their wastes and reusing uh, their what's known as their black liquor. Uh, in terms of commercial services, about 60 odd petajoules used there, and that's nearly all electrification. There's very few uh, areas where space heating, domestic hot, hot water heating, uh, are looking at anything but electrification there. Uh, bricks and glass are, are certainly a very big mixed picture. And, and hopefully, you take away from this, there's a lot of options at place to here still. But they are leaning towards, they are investing towards certain options at the moment. So yeah, a lot of doubts still remain. Uh, electrification, how much can you, what temperature can you do? Firmed versus unfirmed uh, electricity cost uh, and, and really the, the technical feasibility, especially when you start adding on transmission requirements and things like that. A uh, biomass, and of course, we've heard about feedstock availability, regulations that may support and, and also give them the right restrictions to make sure there's confidence over things like digest state. So there's still a lot missing there. So here's a bit of a summary of how we see the energy flows and changes going forward. So I said about 900 or so petajoules coming into the system right now, uh, mainly of, of fossil fuels. And, and we see a fair chunk of that, the biggest chunk of that going towards electrification if we take what they're investing in R&D and exploring right now. But importantly, right at the top there, the no regrets the, the no-brainer type decisions is about efficiency. There's a lot to be done and can be done there. And as they start looking at higher energy costs, you know, no longer $5 a gigajoule, maybe it's 10 or 15, those efficiency, those heat integration options become far more interesting for them. Uh, so you'll see that at the top there, yeah, efficiency, definitely the no-brainer, easy way to go. Heat pumps and MBR, the next one down, uh, that has some really good efficiency there as well. Those petajoules are heat petajoules the required heat. If you consider how much electricity is needed for heat pumps and MBR, you need to divide that by, say, three or four uh, because of the efficiencies of that equipment. Electrode boilers and direct electrification, lots of opportunity there. Uh, and then look, that, that flows through then to bioenergy, hydrogen, what have you. Bioenergy, biogas, sorry, that's looking like quite a small amount from who we're speaking to at the moment. Uh, the momentum that hydrogen has 
says that that's the dominant force in, pro in process heating right now, rightly or wrongly. Uh, a little bit of a guess down the bottom there on oil and gas, they use a, a, lot, of, a lot of energy for processing for LNG and, and offshore oil and gas and extraction and, and petrochemical, a uh, petro uh, uh, refinery. Uh, let's hope that's sort of just about done by 2040. At the very least, they should be able to electrify a lot by 2030, and certainly that safeguard mechanism will uh, give them the push that they need. So a bit quick summary there, I won't go on this too much, but uh, you can see these are the main areas where people are looking uh, for, and yeah, alumina, 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 it's all about that, so that's where the focus is. I will draw your attention to the middle one there on bagasse, and I think it's been talked about a little bit. Uh, we've got 95 or so petajoules of bagasse in this country, uh, which is set up and burned just so it doesn't have to go back on the field. A lot of that can be easily electrified easily, cheaply electrified, very efficiently using mechanical vapor rec recompression technology, freeing up a lot of petajoules for you all to use in, in your different plants and AD plants and what have you. Uh, really good opportunity there. A lot of uncertainty, as I said, this is just a trajectory, we're just extrapolating. This could change with a little bit of policy change, no, almost in an instant. If these alumina uh, and, and mineral processing companies thought that they were going to get uh, a lot more cheaper and, and reliable biogas supply, this would flip very quickly. But this is what they're looking at at the moment, given the, the conditions they have. Uh, a lot of questions there. Will alumina use much more of uh, electrode boilers, or will they go for MVR technology? How quickly will LNG uh, uh, electrify and what have you? So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, through, uh, just a few numbers to throw out down the bottom there, and I said a $40 billion transition. Uh, it, it's somewhere in that vicinity. We're using some very rough high-level metrics there. Very little has been done to work out what's that extra transmission and distribution requirement for electricity um, for this process heating. Very little modelling has been done. Uh, how much R&D is needed there? Uh, it's certainly a lot of R&D is needed for, for uh, hydrogen usage. That really not much done in terms of estimates there. So in summary, yeah, low temperature heating looking really good uh, for electrification. Between 100 and 250 degrees, there's a lot of options and, and a lot of nuance comes in for your location. Bioenergy, we've heard this easiest drop-in fuel. Yes, please, they want that for sure, but we need to have regulation and supply. And hydrogen, goodness me, it's expensive and a lot of technical issues. Finally, I'd just like to announce and share with you some, some news we're really excited about. Uh, Sustainability Victoria, with their uh, uh, bioenergy grants and, and, and renewable grants there, uh, looking to reduce waste in Victoria, uh, have, have helped out and, and joined a consortium here where we have a, a lovely $300,000 to spend over the next couple of years to look at locations, ideal locations for uh, biomethane and biogas within Victoria. Uh, we're bringing together some of the largest industry associations with the largest amounts of food waste, ideal feedstock for, uh, for uh, anaerobic digestion in, in Victoria. And we're very hopeful we'll find at least two or three excellent locations that have very good feasibility uh, for, uh, for anaerobic digestion. And we'll be working through that over the next couple of years. Anyone wants to be involved, please come and see me. We'd like to have more people uh, to make sure we do this a really good job of this one. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. And uh, Shahana around, thank you very much for, for organising and inviting me. Thank you. I guess I'll start with a question. Um, Michael, uh, what's the forward plan for an organisation like yourselves, PepsiCo, in terms of decarbonising. Have you made a public commitment? What's the time frame? How close are you to working out the detail of the plan moving forward? And how much of that will also depend on uh, potential upcoming changes to regulations in Australia? Are we working? Yep, we're good. Look, th there are some public commitments from PepsiCo. And I guess when we look at that, uh, what we have is a, our global chairman and CEO has, has stood in front of Wall, Wall Street and communicated our PepsiCo positive commitments. Now the details are quite extensive, but you know I mentioned in the presentation about a 75% reduction in scope one and two emissions by 2030. 
And we also have a 40% reduction in scope three emissions uh, by 2030. And the business's objective is to get net zero by 2040. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and then. Now, th there are some known strategies and tactics in which we're deploying at our facilities. And um, I guess scope two for us has already been addressed through the procurement of renewable electricity. So, you know, that was an easy win. Um, and it comes at a cost, but absolutely we've, we've already deployed that in the field. Uh, scope one is very, very hard to abate. And when you talk about some of those process technologies, like that 16 megawatt heat exchanger that we had, it's, it's very, very challenging to electrify. It comes at significant capital costs. And I guess we're exploring, you know, what the options are. Um, we are doing a little bit of electrification in our facilities. In fact, we've got an electric boiler uh, being installed later this year in that South Australian facility we discussed. But when we talk about the efficiency gains that you get from such a project, we're talking about two or three percent of the total gas usage for the facility. The, the, the process I described earlier is, is roughly 60 to 70 percent of the site's gas usage. So that's where the big ticket items are and the most challenging to, to, to modify. So I guess that's why biomethane for our scope one emissions is a great tactic because absolutely there's going to be a, a premium associated with it, but we don't have the capital costs uh, and business disruption that we need to, to deploy. Now one thing I haven't touched on is scope three. So a 40% reduction in scope three by 2030. This is by far the hardest to abate. I don't think it matters what industry you're in. If people start talking scope three emissions, it's extremely challenging. But what we do have is an extensive network of uh, third party manufacturers, um, suppliers that are willing to work with us. They also have their own corporate sustainability goals. And that's something we're still navigating through to get our overall strategy for that, for that particular option. But there is some good movement in that space as well. Uh, yep. Oh, thank you. You'll be next. Hello, can you hear me up? Hi, Jim Snow. Uh, Kevin? Um, I noticed the small leakage uh, um, number for methane in pipelines. Is that real leakage or is that unaccounted for gas that also takes into account metering error? I mean, I get a lot of conversations with government about this. Is oh, there's some small amount of methane, methane's bad, it's going to leak into the atmosphere. I think there's, that number needs to be unteased a little for government because a lot of the unaccountable gas is just plain metering error. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure if I got a clear view of, of the question. Do you... Is that number that you put up, the small amount of emissions from pipelines themselves, That's right. is that bulk based on unaccountable gas or is it actual measured emissions? Yes, yeah, so part of that, uh, those figures are from unaccounted for gas, so it's not possible to perfectly measure leakages, and um, so there there are sort of technical um, technical losses that can be can be worked out that is measured, but there are unaccounted for gas that that comes out of that. So uh, you're right. I'll just add to that from AGOG's perspective. So. The current methodologies under Engers that you can use to calculate your unaccounted for gas don't give you a real mechanism to be able to go and actually get, provide a factual emission reduction or emission intensity of your assets. So, I mean, unfortunately, it's not available and there, in, there should be an industry method, method developed because we have very strict standards and we base our estimates on API, which unfortunately overestimates. People would be horrified to see the number of gas emitted from, say, a custody metre set um, that's currently estimated, and it's way below what we what we believe. So there has to be, from an industry perspective, there has to be an actual um, an, an actual research project into understanding what are those actual emissions, so we understand what is our account, unaccounted for gas, because meters aren't accurate, and we can't base that on that our emission intensity, because that's a significant impact, obviously. And we do a lot of work to reduce the volume of methane that is released to atmosphere. I'll add that uh, from a transmission pipeline point of view, that is something that APJ is definitely uh, looking into. We're in active conversations with the clean energy regulator about how to make that change and in, in the process of um, pulling together the, the basis upon making that change. But uh, like all fun things in the regulatory space, it's a bit of a slow roll. But uh, yeah, definitely definitely keen to get away from in, in the, in the um, transmission pipeline space. It's actually even worse than in the distribution space where we just have a, a unit of emissions per kilometre of pipeline. So the only way we, that we could uh, 
reduce our emissions is to reduce the kilometers of pipeline, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, so yeah, definitely work in progress. And if I may, process heating for the pipeline when they're depressurizing the gas, about 0.25% is burnt and used there. That can be electrified as well. 0.25% is nothing. Not when you've got 1,400 or so petajoules going around. That's still, this is real emission reduction potential too. Okay, thank you. We had a question in the middle here. Yeah, um, hello. Uh, thanks very much for that, for those presentations. Really interesting. Um, um, my name is Manuel Warwick. I work in Green Power, New South Wales Government. So thank you for the plug um, from a few of you. Um, <laughs> my question is really about these, this exciting pipeline of um, renewable gas projects, um, mostly biomethane projects, that you see across your networks, I guess APA as well as um, AGIG. Um, how do you see the flows changing? And um, where do you see, I guess, a reversal of flow um, with those kind of regional, re regional projects being really significant in size? And, and is there already sort of an idea how networks can and need to deal with that? Yeah, thanks for the question, Manuel. So I guess um, it's been a really important uh, role for us is to understand what are the implications. It's what's happening to the gas distribution networks and infrastructure assets is like what happened when we had large scale domestic solar uptakes. It changes the complete market mechanisms that we base our processes on now. So we're going to have a distributed generation capacity within gas from these biomethane projects. So you're going to have small scale generation distributed across the country that's going to feed into the network. So what we're looking at is how do we, how do we potentially add compression in areas where an entire biomethane could be decarbonized by adding in compression facilities. So small scale compression that could provide it during downtime because biomethane facilities aren't going to be producing the whole time. So how do we feed that in? And then there's also the complexity in managing the market mechanism that's currently operated. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of nominations and gas flows between market nominated areas, and that complexity needs to be managed. And we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment in terms of well, how is it going to impact our infrastructure and how do we manage the uptake? Because we don't want to be the stall point for getting biomethane into the network. We want to enable. How do we reduce pressures and alter pressures to enable, maximise the volume of gas storage that is biomethane preferentially over a natural gas, for instance. So that's why we're working with a lot of gas producers to kind of maintain. So that opportunity mapping that we see is more enabling us to focus on which areas in the network we need to prioritise for enabling. Thank you. Question over here. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Scott Grierson from Valorify. Um, Jordan really enjoyed your analysis and uh, it's the first time I've seen it and haven't read the report, but thank you for that. Um, I was really interested, given that you come from the big bad gas uh, sector, um, you're sort of preaching to the converted in a sense to this room, but great to see that data. How do you sell that message that you, that you really are, are bringing across about that comparative cost opportunity? And, you know, because really the electrify everything movement has, has sort of captured the hearts and minds of the average consumer, or seem to have. How do you, how do you negate that? How do you deal with that? And what, what, what is, what's your plan? It's a really good question, and I uh, certainly couldn't say uh, we have all of the plan today. It's going to be an ongoing conversation for many, many years to come. But um, look, I, I guess we've we've started by um, realigning what we're talking about to to talk about what actually matters. And what actually matters is the cost of decarbonisation for customers. Uh, we can, we can talk about the the cost of producing biomethane, the cost of uh, pipeline infrastructure, and the cost of storage as much as we want, but the, the only thing that matters to the individual is how much it's going to cost them. I mean, I, aside from a few things around the fringes. What we need is the most economically efficient pathway to gas use decarbonisation for customers. And so we're trying to talk to that conversation. And there's going to be a bit of, a bit of the slowly, slowly, and a bit of uh, misting, bu busting myths along the way. But uh, really turning to that conversation about the cost competitiveness for customers and then trying to make sure that we're involving the, both the, the advocates for industry like yourselves and, and advocates for customers in that journey and in the analysis that we're doing to, to ensure that they don't just see it as the big bad gas industry saying gas is good. So for example, the, um, the data that I ended on, uh, the analysis that I ended on today, um, our, our plans, the next steps for that is to take our methodology that we use there and put that into the hands of a reputable consultant 
get them to bring in uh, advocates from the renewable energy industry, from the decarbonisation advocacy space, from the customer space, and make sure that they're involved in identifying the right assumptions to feed into that model and the use of that model so they can value the outputs and, and recognise the outputs are genuine outputs of that model and, and, uh, and take them forward. So that, that's, that's at least the start. <laughs> Thank you. Another question over there. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, Richard Bartlett. Um, a really good presentation, Jared Irving, um, around the, I uh, like how you broached the topic of um, bio CO2 uh, coming off the upgrader at the back end. That's um, upgrading has obviously been um, uh, across the world for, uh, for decades now, and bio CO2 has always sort of just been up the stack, and we've been focusing on, on the energy component of the biomethane. I'm just thinking in a background of sort of uh, ACU or sort of upwards, upwards pressures on ACU prices and uh, border adjustment mechanisms and things like that. Um, do we, uh, are we planning for a, um, an, an increase in importance of that bio CO2 and um, how can we, I guess, uh, communicate that with obviously markets adjacent to energy but not directly energy users? Yeah. And that's a great question, thank you. And I would have loved to talk a little bit more about biogenic CO2, which just gives me a perfect opportunity. But for every 100 petajoules, we can extract 3.3 million tonnes of CO2, biogenic CO2. That can be either sequestered or used for other alternatives. Now, as we understand the fossil fuel decarbonisation continues, our CO2 sources are going to diminish significantly over time. So what we're going to need is a replacement source of CO2, which is perfect for a biogenic source that would otherwise be released to atmosphere that we can utilise elsewhere. I think it's a perfect opportunity for us. Unfortunately, from an ACU based perspective, there's no recognition between a biogenic based CO2 or a CO2 from a fossil fuel based source. Now, excluding SAF, which there are some standards based around your application of CO2 if you're creating a, a sustainable aviation fuel, what we want to see is the potential growth in that sector is a, a, an acknowledgement that a biogenic CO2 is great and a great outcome for the environment in terms of that circular economy. So it is just another value chain that we see for these projects. And again, some of the projects we see as being viable is capturing that CO2 to be able to pass on to industry because we're seeing CO2 prices skyrocket at the moment with the reduction in Gibson Island coming offline. Recently, we're seeing CO2 prices increase. So it's definitely a really valuable opportunity. Question up here. Good morning, and thank you uh, for the presentations. They've really opened up some doors for me. Uh, my name is Tony D'Alessandro from Renewable Developments Australia. Uh, it's been a terrific series this last couple of days, and it's really opened my eyes to a number of things. Uh, we have one very courageous team member here, uh, Kunar Shah from Anergia, Italy, was uh, courageous enough to mention the cost per gigajoule of these, of these new, what we call, renewable energy scenarios. Can any of you please give me an idea of cost per gigajoule for biomethane and when it comes on screen? I can, if you like. Um, so as part of the opportunity mapping, we've done a basic calculation in terms of what we, what we see in volumes, distance to market, so being able to price pipelines, all of those factors, now, a lot of ours don't include agricultural resources, which of course add in feedstock and other items that we're, we're not well aware of. But what we're seeing is the potential for some facilities with very, very low hanging fruit, we're talking very few, you could be potentially around $15 to $20 per gigajoule. Now that is ticking every box in terms of distance to market, capability, large resource that's currently unused. What we're seeing on the upper end though is 35 to 40. But what we want to see is we're also having discussions with customers calling us. Now, we're a network operator, but we have customers that are saying, well, we'll pay a premium because we don't have any other way to decarbonise. So it's an opportunity cost in terms of for businesses if there's a scope one recognition. If not, value isn't there. So that's the unfortunate side of biomethane is there is a, there is a lower carbon intensity, but without, the, without having somebody gaining that, that's the shortfall that we're currently having in terms of the value of that biomethane. But yeah, I'm not going to shy away. It is going to be a more expensive mechanism. But 
you had have asked me 12 months ago when the market was not capped by government, then we'd be talking about biomethane projects launching because of the viability of well, the comparison between fossil natural gas and biomethane is almost on par. Could probably add on to that. So the Australian bioenergy roadmap actually comes also with a forecast of price series for uh, biomethane, and I think those numbers are very much in line with what Jared has shared. And like what he said, if the there was no gas caps, I believe that the market for biomethane today would be much larger and with a lot more promise than what we're seeing right now. Mine, mine. Yep. Uh, the, uh, the fish fuel CRC came out with uh, similar numbers too. Uh, the other anecdote that I've put forward though is even, even post the price capping um, at a, uh, at a uh, gas origination focus conference that I went to a few months ago, um, old habits die hard. I spent the whole time asking originators how much they're able to access gas for. And uh, the, I, I got two answers, even post price capping, um, people were either able to access gas in the medium term for between for, for mid teens per gigajoule, fifteen to twenty dollars per gigajoule, sorry, high teens, um, or not at all, uh, which really you know backs up that um, the low end of biomethane uh, costs could be in, you know, competitive with natural gas uh, at the moment, and for those who can't access it at all, um, that opens up a whole other range of uh, conversation. If I could just. Uh Add a little bit to what Jared was saying at this uh, of the, the price and what have you, and the demand there. If if we had government contracts saying yes, we will pay that premium for those uh, this construction of this green cement, green bricks, then you know, the price is not really going to matter too much. And this is sorely lacking. I haven't heard a lot mention about end user demand here over the last uh, day or so, and that that's what can swing things. Uh, <coughs> Uh, certainly, uh, brick making companies, they're very keen to be able to have their support, uh, be able to supply green bricks and add that to their portfolio. Uh, they need the green gas certificates and what have you, but there's, the demand is almost there. It just, just needs that bit more push, a few more uh, uh, companies pushing this, whether commercial buildings or government and things like that. So it's, uh, then if it's $30 a gigajoule, $40, it well, doesn't matter. This is, it's going to be passed on and we've got a market. That's great, thank you very much. I think with those concluding comments, I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters in this session, thank Bioenergy Australia for inviting us along and thank the audience members for your insightful questions. And now to lunch before the pigeons beat us. <laughs>